from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, the SEC cracks down. U.S. regulators halting initial public offerings of Chinese companies. What it means for Wall Street, Beijing, and investors. Plus, one of the world's biggest Bitcoin bulls, MicroStrategies, Michael Saylor joins us. The company's stake in Bitcoin now uh, gains of $1.4 billion. This is more investors plow money into the crypto ecosystem. Andreessen Horowitz partner and Coinbase board member Katie Hahn will tell us how they're putting their new crypto fund to work. And fast-growing delivery startup GoPuff closes a $1 billion funding round at a $15 billion valuation. We'll talk about the need for delivery as COVID cases continue to spike. All that in a moment, but first let's get a look at the markets with Bloomberg's Kriti Gupta, Kriti Big Tech, giving investors some concerns today. Walk us through this Friday. Absolutely. Who knew that one earning story could tank the entire market? And Emily, that's exactly what happened with Amazon earnings last night. You did see, of course, their net sales miss, their net forecast miss for the third quarter as well. And here's what happened from small caps, those economically sensitive stocks, all the way to big tech, red on the screen. And it has everything to do with that consumer sentiment. The United States is a consumer-driven economy. If you start to see spending slow down, which is kind of the indication that Amazon earnings really gave, that's going to be a problem for the broader economic recovery. I want to show you the spillover effect, though, because this did hit some of these other stocks as well. Remember, Amazon is an e-commerce company, an e-commerce growth company. It hit those similar sectors, Etsy, eBay, Shopify over in Canada, and of course, Alibaba overseas as well. Those ADRs didn't do so well. Once again, really dealing with this idea that people just may not be spending anymore, that fiscal stimulus, it might be running out pretty soon. And Alibaba, of course, impacted by those China headlines as well. The U.S. SEC is now going to be looking much more closely at those overseas listings. And over in China, they're going to be looking much more closely at companies there that have actually listed here in the States. Which brings me to how big tech here in the States is, out, is performing relative to China. You can really see the Nasdaq Gold and Dragon Index in white. This is a one-month chart, Emily, and you can clearly see the orange line. Big tech in the U.S. is outperforming. But take a look at this. It's starting kind of move over kind of moving in tandem so there is this divergence but take a look at it it dips at the same time just by a different margin emily the question here is does that continue or do you really start to see that divergence grow all right critty thanks so much for the roundup as the uh critty reference there the sec demanding additional disclosures from chinese companies before signing off on their bids to go public in the united states sec chair gary gensler saying the agency staff will have to ensure that Chinese firms seeking to list in the U.S. have gotten permission from China's government to do so if necessary. U.S. regulators must also be able to inspect their audit records within three years as required by law. Joining us now, Bloomberg CHA, who's been covering this developing story. So, Ye, what does this mean for the future of Chinese companies that want to go public in the United States? Um, hi. So SEC probably under some pressure um, because um, the Chinese regulator tightening in a number of the sectors has hit all those stocks listed in the U.S. The crackdown on DD soon after its IPO, then the latest attack on the education company, which effectively wiped out like 90% of their market value. So the SEC had some political pressure to do something on this uh, to increase the scrutiny of uh, Chinese companies. But in practical terms, they should be have there shouldn't be any impact because it's like a pushing open door because Chinese IPO pipeline has already dried up. Company, a number of Chinese companies has effectively halted their IPO already. Um, um, so it shouldn't be have any impact. Well, in the case of Didi in particular, what the Chinese government wanted is kind of unclear. If Didi wanted to go public in the U.S. next week, do these rules now mean they couldn't do that? Yes, um, I think one of the concerns China had is uh, data security. 
All right, Yeshe, it looks like we're having a little problem with his Wi-Fi there, but you got the gist of the story. Big changes ahead for companies from China that want to list in the United States. It's a story we're going to continue to follow. This, of course, after that big crackdown on the online education sector, which is still unfolding. Meantime, Amazon is facing its biggest European Union fine in history, the biggest fine from the EU in history. The EU's data protection watchdog has hit the world's largest online retailer with an $888 million penalty. Amazon disclosing the fine in a regulatory filing. The e-commerce giant accusing Amazon, accused, excuse me, of violations involving how it processes personal data. Amazon says the decision is without merit and plans to appeal. All right, coming up, MicroStrategy's bet on Bitcoin has been a blessing and kind of a curse this quarter. We're going to find out why with CEO Michael Saylor next. And Robinhood CEO Vlad Tenev told me crypto is becoming a bigger part of all transactions on the now public trading app. Shares picking up slightly today, closing up almost 1%, though still a few dollars below its listing price. We'll have more next. This is Bloomberg. Cryptocurrency has been, been uh, becoming a, a larger piece of the overall transaction-based revenue. Uh, so we expect that to continue to diversify over time, both outside of, of transactions and within. And in general, we're proud of the business model that we've introduced. We've saved, uh, we've put lots of money back in customers' pockets, and that's going to be a big part of what Robinhood stands for and what we continue to do with future products that we launch. Robinhood CEO Vlad Tenev there talking to me about the company's crypto ambitions as it hit the public markets. And Bitcoin is an already big and soon to become perhaps even bigger bet over at MicroStrategy. The software company now owns so much Bitcoin, its gains are worth some $1.4 billion dollars on paper. I want to bring back Michael Saylor, CEO of MicroStrategy, to discuss. Michael, always good to have you here on the show. So you just reported results, beat on earnings and revenue. You're sitting on these massive paper gains, but racking up these accounting charges for the Bitcoin that you're holding. Walk us through your latest strategy. Um, well, you know, we're lo leveraged long Bitcoin. We've got a 10-year view. And our view is that Bitcoin is an open digital property network. And one day billions of people are gonna hold digital property a la Bitcoin on their mobile phones. And so we just wanna get there before the billions of users get there. And we're patient. Bitcoin's now at its highest level since mid-May, $40,750 at the moment. Why should investors invest in MicroStrategy rather than just Bitcoin itself? Well, MicroStrategy is an operating company, and so we sweep operating income into Bitcoin. And we're also leveraged long. So we borrowed $2.2 billion at a blended interest rate of about 1.5% interest. So if you, if you like Bitcoin, then you definitely would like the idea of owning $2.2 .2 billion of it at 1.5% interest. If you expect it to go up more than 1.5% a year, then that leverage is really working for you. So I think we've been very intelligent about the way we put together the leverage and, uh, and we're unique in that regard. There is no publicly traded company that's got our Bitcoin position with the ability uh, to raise debt and buy Bitcoin with debt. Now, you have this opportunity coming up with that at-the-market filing to sell another billion dollars in new stock to raise funds to buy more Bitcoin. What's the likelihood that you will do that? Well, I think in time we will buy Bitcoin. It'll just be a question of whether we buy it with cash flows or with debt or with equity. And that's all just a function of market conditions. And we try to do whatever's going to be accretive for our shareholders. Uh, I'm, I'm very, very bullish on Bitcoin long term. The developments of the past quarter are wonderful for Bitcoin, and they're setting up a, a, really, nice, um, a really nice platform for it to grow from. So what would market conditions need to look like in order for you to do that? 
Well, you know, as you can imagine, we're looking at the debt markets all the time and the equity markets and the Bitcoin markets and the option markets. And, and we have to make decisions uh, subject to market conditions that are going to be accretive to everybody involved. So uh, we, make, we make those decisions when the opportunities present themselves. You'll know when we do it. Are you looking at other coins? Are you looking at Ethereum? I know that obviously you're, you're really optimistic about the future of Bitcoin, but it is a more narrow view of what, uh, you know, the blockchain can be. You know, we think that uh, holding Bitcoin for the long term is the highest upside, lowest risk strategy we can pursue. Um, you know, some people think diversification means buy other types of cryptocurrencies or buy other kinds of equities. We think that by holding Bitcoin, we're diversified because we can see Bitcoin sitting on the balance sheets of cities, states, governments, companies, small investors, big investors. And ultimately, we think Bitcoin is going to be the core to big tech innovation at Apple, Amazon, and Facebook. So we just want to be holding the Bitcoin. There's never going to be more than 21 million of them. And we think that every investor and every company and every government on earth can benefit from Bitcoin. Walk me through how you see that innovation at big tech companies around Bitcoin happening. At, at what rate, did you say? Walk me through how you see that oh. innovation happening at those companies that you mentioned. I mean, Facebook, of course, uh, you know, tried to do Libra, didn't work out so well. Yeah, so let's take examples of Square and PayPal right now. Um, and even Robinhood. Uh, for the next 65 and a half hours, you can't trade equity and you can't get banking services and you can't sell your real estate. You probably can't trade in gold either. What you can do is trade in crypto. And so Bitcoin in particular is something that everybody can get to 24-7, 365. And that's driving a lot of demand to integrate. I think that you're also going to see that Bitcoin is an international trust network. And so for companies like Twitter and Instagram, Facebook and YouTube, they have issues with spam and cybersecurity. And one of the best ways for them to eliminate spam and to upgrade cybersecurity is to integrate with Bitcoin and especially the Lightning Network in order to create higher levels of creditworthiness and trust with all of the cyber counterparties that are trading on their platforms. Well, so of I, course, I Jack, Dorsey, Jack Dorsey is making a big bet on crypto and Bitcoin with Square. And of course, he's also talked about how t Bitcoin could be integrated into the Twitter platform. That said, there's also this view that you know, the rise of the blockchain and cryptocurrency is a threat to centralized networks like Twitter. You know, how do you square that? Well, um, I think that Bitcoin is the solution to cybersecurity at Facebook and Twitter and Google. And, and if you wanted to improve the quality of the user experience, then you need to have skin in the game. And so Bitcoin provides skin in the game for all of, all of the interactors in the cyber environment. I think that Jack understands that, and that's why he's enthusiastic about Bitcoin being integrated into Twitter. And I think that you're going to see other big tech networks like Facebook and Apple and Google and Amazon realize that the killer app is, is cybersecurity integrated into an international trust network. Interesting. What do you make? I know you were following Robinhood's IPO. What do you make of Robinhood becoming a bigger player in crypto? You know, obviously, they've talked about wanting to expand beyond trading, crypto transactions becoming a bigger piece of the pie. They mentioned Doge uh, uh, in, in their risk factors because, uh, you know, a significant amount of the transactions in crypto on Robinhood involve Dogecoin. You know, you know what's your take on them becoming more involved in this space? Well, you know, Crypto.com put out a survey this week where they actually showed that uh, the number of users in the crypto world went from 100 million to 200 million in four months, and the number of Bitcoin users has surged to 114 million, and they're adding 2 million Bitcoin users a week. So this is clearly where the excitement is and where the traffic is. And since Robinhood wants to reach out and be engaged with as many people as possible, I mean, the only option you have for engagement for the next, you know, 50 hours 
is Bitcoin or some kind of cryptocurrency. And of course, Bitcoin is the risk off king of all the cryptocurrencies. So for Robinhood, it makes total sense that they would want to drive that hard. Now, I know you've talked about 10 years, but when might MicroStrategy sell some of its Bitcoin to realize these paper gains? I mean, are you saying you won't do that for 10 years or could that happen sooner? Yeah, I mean, Bitcoin is not really a trading strategy. People joke it's an exit strategy. What we want to hold is a form of non-sovereign store of value forever. So uh, it's like I had a billion dollars and I want to give it to my great grandchildren. I'm either going to buy land or I'm going to buy gold or I'm going to buy some other tangible property. Bitcoin's digital property. And so if I buy a billion dollars of Bitcoin, there's no reason why I wouldn't be holding it 100 years from now. Um, I took a survey. The average Twitter follower thinks it's going to last 3,500 years. Nobody's in a hurry with Bitcoin. We're thinking that it's the future of property. Interesting. All right. Well, uh, we're going to have to catch up uh, before 100 years from now uh, to talk about how that thinking is evolving. Michael Saylor, MicroStrategy Chair and CEO, good to have you back here on the show. Okay, coming up, The Way We Shop is getting a hands-on makeover with the emergence of live stream commerce. Not just e-commerce, live stream commerce. It is already big in China, but Pop Shop Live is bringing it to the United States. We're gonna find out more from founder and CEO, Dan Dan Lee, next. And an update on a story we brought you yesterday. Disney has responded to a lawsuit from actress Scarlett Johansson. She claims the company broke its promise to release her latest film, Black Widow, only in movie theaters when it also made it available on the Disney Plus streaming service, meaning she got a smaller contractual payout. Disney called her complaint, quote, sad and distressing in its cautious, callous disregard for the horrific and prolonged global effects of the pandemic. We're going to be watching for more developments here. This is Bloomberg. When consumers couldn't shop at physical stores through the pandemic, they didn't just go online, they turned to live streams. The startup Pop Shop Live now winning over millennials with its own take on live stream commerce. So what's the buzz all about? Pop Shop Live founder and CEO Dan Dan Lee joins us now in this week's Retail Transformed segment. Dan Dan, thank you so much for joining us. So live stream e-commerce is big in China, less so here in the United States. What's your vision for this? Yeah, um, so I, I I think this is uh, perfect timing for everyone to know more about live streaming uh, shopping. So Pop Shop Live is a live streaming marketplace that combine entertainment, social, and commerce. And this is a movement really started by the uh, by millennial and Gen Z because they demand and desire for an authentic communication with brands and sellers. So uh, in Pop Shop. We, uh, the live streaming shopping is really taking the best part of in-person shopping, think customer service and storytelling, and also the best part from traditional e-commerce, think scalability and convenience, and also pushes us into social entertainment and beyond. And anyone uh, on, on the platform or on live shopping, they can start their own live shopping channel and sell directly to a national audience. Um, in the past year, because of COVID, we have prioritized working with brick and mortar stores, as you can see on the screen, a lot of them streaming from their store. Um, right. And we helped them to multiply their revenue uh, in a few months. And so, oh. Dan, Dan, how does this compare to you know, QVC and Home Shopping Network? You know, something that yeah. people of my generation are more familiar with. Yeah, so I think there are definitely, uh, the future is a lot like the past and they're always going to be new again. So I think there are definitely some uh, uh, like connection with that experience. But I think the main difference is the real-time interactive uh, uh, interaction. This is something that QVC might have a little bit, but I think the digital mobile first uh, experience really 
um, um, in uh, like like amplify that real time interaction. Now there is competition in this arena. There's TikTok, of course. There's Amazon Live, Facebook Live Shopping Fridays. I didn't actually even know they did that, but they do. Um, everyone seems to see that this is part of the future. What will sh set Pop Shop apart? Yeah, I think first of all, live streaming is more uh, live streaming shopping at this uh, generation is more than putting the the broadcasting and the storefront together. It's like I mentioned, it's a lot more about the real time interaction. So, give you an example. Um, last year uh, during uh, uh, Christmas, we have a seller uh, doing a Secret Santa show with hundreds of users. And 80 of the customer make the purchase during the live show and send the gift to other audience in the live show. And the entire four hour show, you can see people uh, not only about purchasing, but it's also about in a community that they're unwrapping their gift, uh, doing a two way call with the seller and everyone just tear with joy. So I think a lot of those experiences is not something that you you can see in uh, QVC or Amazon Live, and we are a lot more focused on building the community and building an immersive entertainment experience that elevate every every elevate people's everyday life. Now, one of the trends we saw in Amazon and Pinterest results they just reported earnings this week is that customers are going back to brick and mortar. I mean, as we come out of the pandemic, how much of an appetite do you think there is for this in the United States? Yeah, um, so like uh, like I mentioned in the past year, we work with brick and mortar stores and a lot of the brick and mortar store actually adopting a pop shop first um, platform. And uh, there's one store in um, in, in LA, uh, Los Angeles. Uh, they actually, after they use pop shop, they closed their two re smaller retail store in Los Angeles and they open a 5,000 square feet space for production and fulfillment. And now they call themselves a media company. And there's also another okay. seller. <laughs> there's also another seller that um, uh, they didn't have a fan base before they joined Pop Shop. And a few weeks ago, they celebrate their one year anniversary on Pop Shop by reopening their store for a day. And they have a crowd waiting outside uh, wow. outside of the store and they open okay. the door and they have to ask everyone one by one what's your pop shop name that's awesome all right we'll continue to follow how the trend plays out pop shop live founder and ceo dan dan lee thank you so much for explaining all of that to us okay coming up we're going to get insights on the latest developments in crypto from katie Hahn, general partner at andreessen horowitz as the venture capital firm dives into nfts this is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Let's head back to the markets now with Bloomberg's Kriti Gupta, who's been honing in on crypto. What are you watching, Kriti? Well, Emily, a risk off day in the markets, but a pretty great day in the world of cryptocurrency. Take a look at this the Bloomberg Galaxy Crypto Index up. 2%. Bitcoin only up about half a percent, but take a look at Ethereum up almost 5%. This is going to be really crucial, like I said, in this background of risk off behavior where you saw stocks, bonds, commodities all lower on the day, of course, off those Amazon earnings. Take a look at this, though, on a three month time frame because this is kind of bounce that you're seeing. It goes against the trend. You've seen this massive selling pressure when it comes to Bitcoin question is, does this bounce continue or is this kind of uh, just a one time by the dips type of situation? I want to show you how it spills over into some of the stocks, though, because that's really a completely different story when it comes to those year to date uh, gains. Year to date, Bitcoin is down 37 percent. But take a look at these stocks. Riot Blockchain, for example, up 3.3 percent. So there is that divergence now between cryptocurrencies and the stocks that are exposed to them. I mean, PayPal seems to be the only one that's actually down year to date because of that Bitcoin exposure. But when you look at some of these other names, Emily, that divergence is very real. All right, Kriti, thanks so much for the roundup. And again, Bitcoin at a high from May to more than 40 
$8,000 at this moment. I want to stick with crypto. Longtime venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz recently launched a new $2.2 billion fund to bet on the rapidly growing crypto ecosystem. It was one of the earliest investors in Coinbase and has a growing team of crypto specialists and advisors looking to spot the next of what have been many crypto waves. Joining me now here in the studio, a general partner at Andreessen Horowitz, who's leading that charge and also spent a decade as a federal prosecutor, Katie Hahn. Katie, so great to have you here in the studio. And of course, you worked with you know regulatory agencies from the SEC to the FBI. So you've seen both sides of this coin, if you will. Um, Given how fast the environment is changing, the volatility that we've seen, what do you see as the new opportunities out there to put that money to work? Yeah. Well, one of the things that I think is really exciting, and by the way, thank you for having me. It's so nice to be here in yes, person instead of on Zoom. Thanks for yeah. to the studio. What makes this moment, I think, we think so unique in crypto is that we've seen, you know, crypto by its nature has been kind of cyclical. But one of the things we've seen in the last year is that whole new audiences are coming in. So one of the earliest use cases of crypto systems, of course, were financial use cases. And one of the things we've seen for the last year plus are entirely new kind of audiences coming in, a real mainstream of crypto across things like NFTs, uh, DAOs, DeFi, um, and many other kind of applications. Of course, DeFi is also a financial application. But um, these are the kind of bleeding edges of crypto that we are very excited about. And we're excited to put the new fund to work. Now, well, given the market volatility, and I know that you're investing at the earliest stages, but the markets have come down, you know, across the board when you look at, uh, you know, coins themselves. Has that impacted how you're making investments at all? You know, it really hasn't, actually. And let me tell you why. We are focused on kind of a seven to ten year view, Emily. We're not a crypto hedge fund. Many crypto <laughs> funds are hedge funds. They're trading in and out of to uh, coins and tokens. We're not. We're making long-term bets on kind of infrastructure plays, architecture plays, and things, like I said, like platforms. I mean, you mentioned Coinbase, but you know there are platforms out there like OpenSea. Um, and it's a great moment for, for example, NFTs. So, Since you mentioned OpenSea, I know that's a co another company you just invested in. You're joining the board there, focused on NFTs. NFTs seem to have a lot of hype over the last six months, and that seems to be fading. Why don't you think that this is a fad? Yeah, I don't think so, and let me tell you why. I mean, many people focus on NFTs and think it's just only digital art, and it's actually much more than that. It's a new economic kind of paradigm for the web, and I really believe, and we at Andreessen Hortz Crypto believe, that this is really going to redefine the web by putting power directly into the hands of creators, not just of digital artists, but of all kinds of content creators, from media to entertainers, sports figures, and many others, and also into the hands of users, power into the hands of users, and away from centralized platforms, things like YouTube, which have pretty high take rates and high barriers to entry. And so we see that changing right now already. Now, you know, obviously you're an investor in Coinbase, but would it make sense to invest in any new crypto exchanges, or are the ones we have enough? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're kind of seed agnostic, stage agnostic, and we're looking across it. You mentioned exchanges, which are picks and shovels, and we certainly expect to deploy part of this new $2.2 billion fund into kind of picks and shovels, but we're also investing heavily in tokens, um, things like DAOs, other platforms, like we've talked about OpenSea, and I am joining the board. Mm -hmm. And OpenSea really sits at, we think, really this unique position where they, much like Coinbase you mentioned, allowed an early class of consumers, ordinary people, to access crypto, like Bitcoin and Ethereum in those early days. OpenSea is mainstreaming kind of NFTs and this whole new experience for a whole new class of users. And that's why this year we've seen a mainstreaming, a further mainstreaming of crypto happen. You know, you have now sports fans. They weren't crypto natives and they weren't even people particularly focused on crypto. But those sports fans are lining up to purchase things like Top Shots. And they're also lining up on Robinhood. Yeah, I spoke to Vlad Tenev yesterday, and he said crypto transactions are becoming an increasingly big part of their pie. Yep. What does it mean to have Robinhood be more involved yeah. in this space, more retail trading happening in crypto, and you know, much more accessible? But you know, I think sometimes the concern is that retail investors don't always know exactly what they're getting into. Well, so Robinhood is a part of the Andreessen Horowitz portfolio, albeit not part of the crypto fund. Right. Um, so I just want to state that right, first, you are right off here. Investor in Robinhood, yeah. I know that. Yeah, but not the crypto fund. Yeah. Um, the venture fund and our late stage growth fund. And I think what Robinhood has done for kind of democratizing access to finance is very, um, among new classes of people, is really in line with the ethos of crypto, of course, um, which is 
democratizing access, um, and what it's done for a whole new generation of users to become interested in finance, I think is really cool. So we think there's a lot of opportunity ahead. That said, I'm not close to the company. We're really focused on crypto. Now, there's a new infrastructure bill in Congress that would proposing to raise $28 billion in taxes, taxes on crypto investors. Individuals yeah. might have to start disclosing more of their transactions. What's your take on this? Yeah, look, my take on this, I've seen a lot of media headlines in the last days characterizing uh, this infrastructure bill. But my take on this is actually it's uh, uh, it's actually further mainstreaming of crypto because it's a recognition on the part of 67 senators right now who voted for this bill that crypto is big. Crypto is a big portion of the economy. It's here to stay and it's growing. So I think it's actually kind of uh, putting its imprimatur on the fact that crypto is not going anywhere. This is not an industry that's kind of hiding in the shadows. Now, I do want to say on the infrastructure bill, there are some pieces of it, putting my con law mm -hmm. hat on, that I don't agree with. I think are a little bit um, vague and overbroad. For example, the notion that smart contracts and computer code can generate um, 1099s, for example. And of course, we're actively working with policymakers and legislators behind the scenes with our incredible policy team at Andreessen Horowitz that we've really built out to help inform this. So can you tell us what Gary Gensler plans to do? Because we all want to know how crypto is going to be regulated in yeah. the United States. Well, I think, look, one really important point where you talk about Gary Gensler and the SEC is to recognize that crypto is not a monolith. As I said, there are DAOs, there are NFTs, there are financial use cases, and certainly where there are tokens that are securities or that might be securities or touch on financial use cases, consumer protection. You know, we are all for responsible innovation. We just want more regulatory clarity. So we would like to hear what Gary Gensler plans to do. But it's important to remember there's a whole big part of this ecosystem that has nothing to do with SEC regulations. I mean, would you think that a digital version of a baseball card or a piece of art, should that be regulated by the SEC? It, it's not in the physical world. And we don't think it should be just because it's in a digital form and has the word crypto in it or uses crypto architecture. Now, again, I know that some of these are Andreessen Horowitz companies, but do you think that the blockchain is a threat to companies, centralized networks like Facebook, like yeah. Twitter, yeah. like Google? Oh, for sure. I absolutely do think so. <laughs> um, because again, the ethos of crypto is decentralization and it's shifting power away from a centralized few. So I do very much think so. And you know, Emily, I think that's one reason why yesterday you heard Mark Zuckerberg 28 times mention the metaverse and the content creator economy. They see this is coming. It's not just tech incumbents. Coca-Cola, I don't know if you caught this news, but Coca-Cola yesterday announced it will be doing NFTs on Decentraland. Mm -hmm. um, so this is not a fad. Uh, this is very much something that we think is here to stay. And yes, um, big tech certainly recognizes this. So talk to me about, you know, do you think Facebook will be the one to lead the metaverse or will it be... So, you know, someone will it be everyone and yeah. not Mark Zuckerberg? Yeah, you know what I mean. Well, I think look, one of the things about the metaverse <laughs> and, and about crypto is it's open and the barriers to entry are low. And I think one of the things we see is we see tremendous innovation happening outside the United States. I can't tell you how many. Um, entrepreneurs we're seeing that are experimenting with uh, crypto plays and the metaverse, um, the gaming, the intersection, by the way, of gaming and crypto is just, we're seeing kind of an explosion there. And we're seeing it happen all over the place, Southeast Asia, Australia, Europe, Africa. Um, really, it's not just limited to the US. And that's one of our messages to US regulators is let's harness this. Let's really encourage this important innovation. It's a real driver of economic activity. You mentioned DAOs a couple of times, yeah. which is something we've not talked a lot about on this show. And I wonder if you could explain in the simplest terms <laughs> what they are yes. and why yes. they could be so important. Sure. Well, let's start by breaking down the acronym <laughs> DAOs. You know, crypto, like all fields, has a lot of acronyms. <laughs> DAOs, Decentralized Autonomous Organization. Mm -hmm. And basically, the easiest way to think about it, Emily, is if you think about a company uh, in the traditional world and you yeah. think about shareholders, DAOs are are a new way for people to organize. Um, so almost, if you will, like shareholders. And instead of a company, there's a piece of computer code and people can organize all around this. But actually, unlike just shareholders in the traditional corporate context, with the DAO, you have these communities of people all over the world that are actively participating in management decisions, in governance decisions, in technical design decisions um, involving these protocols. So that's something really interesting. It's very bleeding edge, and we're seeing a lot more activity happening. And that's why one of the reasons why we've been investing in the space for years. You know, other VCs are starting to kind of try and participate with DAOs. Um, but of course, one thing about traditional VCs are they need to maximize ownership. 
which is a little bit uh, against the ethos of, of these DAOs, against community participation. And we've pioneered, because we've been in this space for years, this really bespoke, uh, you know, really unique delegate program. So we can still maximize ownership for our LPs, for our fiduciary duty, um, but at the same time contribute to decentralization. So we have delegates that we delegate our stake, uh, ranging from universities, mm -hmm. NGOs like Kiva and Mercy Corps and even corporates. I feel like I just learned so much in like nine minutes. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, for Emily. Hope all your all viewers in. did. Yes. Thank you. Katie Thanks Hahn, for having Andrews me. and Horwich General Partner, will be watching where you place your bets. Thanks so much for coming Thank here. Thank you for having me. Into the studio. All right. Coming up, delivery startup GoPuff, now valued at $15 billion after a new fundraise. We're going to speak with the CEO, Yakir Gola, about how the company stands out from companies like DoorDash and Uber Eats as the delivery space evolves rapidly. This is Bloomberg. Bezos may have convinced the world that his space company Blue Origin can successfully launch passengers into space and also have them land safely. But the world's richest man has failed to convince the U.S. Government Accountability Office that Blue Origin should be part of NASA's plan to go back to the moon. Bezos sent a personal appeal after Elon Musk's SpaceX became the sole winner of a $2.9 billion contract to develop a moon lander for NASA. The federal agency upheld NASA's decision, saying it wasn't required to make multiple awards. Well, fast-growing delivery startup GoPuff raised a billion dollars in new funding from global investors like Blackstone and Fidelity, the company increasingly shaking up the delivery market dominated by DoorDash and Uber Eats by making seemingly contrarian bets like buying brick-and-mortar stores. Joining us now to discuss GoPuff CEO, Yakir Gola. Yakir, great to have you on the show. And I know that GoPuff is really unique in the delivery space because you own the supply chain end-to-end, -end, whether it is BevMo or food trucks. Talk to us about how you stand out from, I know you call them partners, Uber Eats, uh, and companies like DoorDash. Yeah, thank you so much for having me today, Emily. Uh, it's great to be on your show. Look, when we started our business eight years ago, just to take a step back, you know, Raf and I bootstrapped this company. And before uh, launching GoPuff, we both worked with our parents in the small business setting. Our family is, you know, our immigrants here moved here and we worked really hard. And, you know, I, I helped my dad uh, build, scale the jewelry business and Raf worked with his parents in the restaurant business. And we saw, you know, the, the importance of hard work and the importance of building a business that's very sustainable. So the way we built our business was, you know, with vertical integration in mind. You know, and exactly what you said, you know, having micro fulfillment centers all across the U.S. and being able to control the customer experience as well as have really great margins because we make our margins off our products, right, not off service fees. So when you fast forward eight years and what we've been building, we have a network of over 500 micro fulfillment centers, uh, one of the largest liquor license holders in the U.S., uh, you know, over 10,000 employees and millions of happy customers. And this is what we do every single day. We wake up in the morning and we focus on instant needs, which is a category we essentially created uh, eight years ago. So I would put us really in a category of one, the way to think about our business, because our approach has been different. The technology that we have is the best technology for micro fulfillment centers. We deliver in 20 minutes and there's no other platform globally where you can get your snacks and your ice cream and your baby products, pet food, and now, you know, hot foods like uh, with our GoPuff Kitchen announcement, all delivered in 20 minutes. So give me a sense of the busiest time, because my sense is that it's more of a, a late night uh, behavior to, to go to GoPuff. But, you know, but obviously I know that's evolving. Yeah, look, it's no secret we started off as a college delivery business with 100 products, right? Um, today, you know, GoPuff now has 5,000 SKUs, right? As I mentioned, we sell anything from over-the-counter medication, alcohol, ice cream. Baby products is actually our fastest-growing category from a year-over-year -year perspective, and our customers have grown up with us. 
right? Less than 10% of customers today are college students, and we also all are available 24 seven. So, you know, maybe that's how we started, but today, you know, anyone that wants instant needs comes to GoPuff, and we're seeing people order at all hours of the day. So how do you keep growing in a market that has so many, you know, what people would look at as competitors like Uber Eats and DoorDash, where also, you know, they're expanding what they're trying to deliver as well? Yeah, I mean, uh, what, you could, what I could tell you is Uber Eats actually partnered with us because they saw that our scale and that we created this industry of instant needs, right? When they looked at you know, who to partner with, uh, they chose us and we do the full end-to-end -end delivery you know, for Uber Eats uh, for all convenience offerings, right? Through the GoPuff platform. And so when they looked at the scale in terms of how many micro-fulfillment centers we have, we cover nearly a thousand US cities uh, and we have an amazing customer experience with a wide assortment, which is why they chose to partner with us. And look, I mean, there's other companies focused sort of in the restaurant delivery space, but look, I, what I could tell you is this industry is in such the early days. I mean, GoPuff operates in a multi-trillion dollar you know, industry, uh, and it, we're, si we're still such in the early days of people using technology to get products delivered, and, and, but it's growing at such a rapid rate. I can tell you we're at the forefront of, of the future, right, in terms of the scale that we have. Even next month, we're launching 80 micro-fulfillment centers just in a single month. And this is wow. a hard business, right? This is, you know, we have inventory, we have operating micro-fulfillment centers, um, you know, we have a, a great network of driver partners, right? We have a great ads business. I mean, this has been eight years in the making, so okay. we have a massive head start, and we're at the forefront here. So last quick question, you're expanding in the UK, you've got this $15 billion valuation, everyone wants to know how far you are from an exit, whether it's an IPO or a SPAC, and how you're thinking about this, quickly. Look, we're just getting started, right? I mean, it's a testament to our team and our execution to date, um, but we're really excited about the future. I talked about how big the opportunity is, you know, for the instant needs category, but I still think we're in the early days. We're building this business over the long term, and we're just going to continue to focus on our customer right now. All right. Yakir Gola, CEO of GoPuff. We'll keep our eye on you guys. Thanks so much for joining us. Okay, coming up, big tech ending in the red this week as investors worried about slowing growth ahead. We'll dig into big tech earnings. It was a bonanza week. Next, this is Bloomberg. Gaming and gig companies among those reporting earnings next week. Take Two Interactive kicking off the week with their quarterly report. Lyft, Match, Activism, Blizzard out Tuesday. Wednesday, we're going to hear from Uber, EA, and Etsy. Square, Expedia, and Zynga reporting Thursday. And DraftKings and meme stock favorite AMC Friday. But it was all about big tech this week. The results leaving some investors worried about slowing growth at mega cap tech companies. Analyst Dan Ives doesn't share that sentiment. We are in the midst of a massive bull cycle for tech going into well into next year. And those that have called about the rotation to value, I'd rather be in the left lane owning growth, given what we see on this digital transformation. So we continue to view this as just it's a green light to own tech. And I think this week you just feel more and more comfortable owning it, given the numbers we've seen. Let's take a look back on the week that was with our own Ed Ludlow. Huge numbers from these companies, right. but not big market reactions. Why? Because investors are already looking to the future. And it was a blockbuster quarter for a lot of the big tech names. But what they're saying is this is the real reopening now. Consumers are leaving their homes. Their spending behaviors are different. They're not inclined to buy things online. That's impacting advertising. So that rate of growth is dissipating down the line. But let me ask you this, what were you doing in May of June of last year? Uh, I was stuck at home anchoring the show in my basement. Exactly, <laughs> right. And what we misremember is that- With all, Mallory. <laughs> all of the big trends that came out of the pandemic, subscriptions, services, those didn't happen in May and J June, they happened later. So what CEOs are saying is, 
We had this blockbuster quarter ending in June, but last June the situation was dire. Those, in, those earnings were so heavily impacted, so the comparisons are very distorted. It's a tough comparison. And so if you see those mega growth rates in this quarter, it can't possibly continue like that. We're looking at Amazon falling below Alphabet's market cap here. I was honestly shocked that their forecast disappointed. You know, there's this return to brick and mortar. We saw those Pinterest numbers plunged. People just want to get out into the world and shop. For whatever reason, Wall Street is fixated on the deceleration of retail, online retail. They looked at Amazon and they thought, my goodness, what has happened to e-commerce? It's not just Amazon. Remember, Etsy, eBay, Pinterest, they all saw their stock fall pretty heavily. And they ignored the higher margin businesses. AWS and cloud did really well. Amazon's ad business did really well. But they looked at that chart on your screen right now and thought, oh my gosh, goodness, this boom in pa pandemic fuel boom in e-commerce is over. So what's the year to come then? For yeah, big tech. You, you forget that all of these companies have other problems. Apple were talking about supply uh, chain constraints, mm -hmm. semiconductor shortages. That will impact how many devices they can sell. Mm -hmm. That growth rate in services will slow down. Then you have Facebook. Its platform isn't as sticky. It doesn't resonate as much with people who are stuck at home on their screens like that. So really, the question is, what are the new products that are going to drive that user engagement? Well, according to Mark Zuckerberg, it's all about the metaverse. So we're going to be watching how that one what is plays the metaverse, out. That, that, honestly. Exactly. That is his next big bet. Well, you should watch the interview with Katie Hahn for more information. Uh, our Ed Ludlow, thanks so much for joining us and rounding out the week. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Stay tuned. David Weston next with Wall Street Week. He'll be joined by Wall Street Bets founder Jamie Rogozinski and former SEC counsel Tom Gorman. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg.